Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three. Uh, I think we have some great material to cover this week. Uh, so in this video, I'll, as usual, I'll be talking about discussion boards, reactions to the discussion boards, and then going into the, I'll actually briefly address the videos, additional videos that are posted for this week, and then go into the chapters. Uh, first off, I think the, the, the reactions or the, what came up for everyone in this discussion board was essential. Uh, you know, talking about where are our reactions, where are those maybe emotional triggers for us that we need to be aware of can be, you know, it's, it's super important and essential in maintaining, you know, a beneficial lens of, of viewing counseling and maintaining that we're beneficial to clients. Uh, so with that being said, though, these personalizations in, in one model of supervision, that's kind of what these, these emotional reactions or triggers are called, are personalizations, when we are having as the counselor, when we're having our reactions. They're normal and natural. They're going to continue to surface for you. Uh, if they haven't already, they will. Uh, and throughout, throughout your career, they will. Uh, even just this week, I had some reactions that I'll talk about in a second to some clients or one client in particular that I was working with just a couple of days ago. Uh, but, you know, they're normal and natural. That doesn't mean that we can just kind of brush it off. It's like, oh, that's always happens. They're important to attend to. So talking to a supervisor is usually like the, the first step uh, in, in processing those reactions and how they might be influencing in subtle or overt ways uh, your counseling work. The, the core is, you know, how can we make sure that we're following that ethical, meta-ethical principle of non-maleficence? How are, can we ensure that we're doing no harm? And then beneficence, can we make sure that we're doing good? Uh, so yeah, these, these reactions can, you know, surface in, in the ethical realm. Uh, another way that I was looking at this is sometimes those personalizations will be like almost like small inner tugging. It's like something is just kind of being tugged on either your heart or your head or, you know, something's being pulled on, you know, like, I don't know exactly what's surfacing for me, but something's there. Uh, so for an example, that's actually the, the, the reaction that I had this week. So there's a client who he was recently, well, he's divorced several years ago and he's starting a new relationship with, with someone who's out of the country and, but he has a son in, in Idaho. So he's kind of pulled back and forth of like where to be, where does he does he want to you know start this new relationship? But he's leaving his son. Uh, so I noticed some of my inner reactions of okay, so my kids are incredibly important. I have three sons. Uh, I guess just to disclose a little bit, my wife and I have experienced you know recurrent miscarriage, so we've lost a lot of children. Uh, so I, I think that's really impacted how important my kids are to me. I think they would have been important no matter what, but it's like even more so. So I think maybe one of the tuggings that I had is like, ooh, I kind of react when, he, when the possibility of him leaving his kid comes, his child comes up, his son. You know, and I think, you know, in the session, I was able to maintain, like, in the end, the client can do whatever he wants. I understand that. Uh, and, you know, his circumstance is his circumstance. Uh, and it wouldn't be neglecting his child. The child would have care. The child would be safe. Uh, but I noticed those reactions surfacing me. So I plan, you know, we have a weekly uh, clinical meeting for the company that I work with. So I'll be working with, I'll, I'll likely bring that up as a case staffing just to make, just to talk about my reactions and kind of get some feedback, get some kind of ideas and making sure that I can maintain my presence with the client, that I can maintain my ability to, you know, do good, help this client, uh, not let those inner tuggings, those reactions hold me back. So, uh, but once again, the first step was me just like acknowledging and being open to those tuggings and then kind of reflecting on it, recognizing, like, I think I kind of understand where it's coming from. And I think that's, that's a big part of the battle. It's just, you know, coming to that awareness, understanding, okay, where is this coming from? Okay, this is likely my issue that I just need to process. And then, you know, consulting with others kind of confirm that that's the approach I'm taking. So, uh, yeah, keep, keep talking about it. That's such an important part of counselor education. And another thing that I wanted to bring up is sometimes our inner reactions 
aren't just our rate of reaction. Sometimes the dynamic that's, that's playing out with the client, it's almost like a transference reaction. So the client is responding to us in ways that they respond to other people in their life. So our reactions can sometimes be very therapeutic to utilize with the client uh, and client family. So, so for example, uh, if you're going to, you know, thinking about, you know what, I think the reaction I'm having is likely the reaction that, you know, that this family member's having or that other people out, outside relationships might feel towards this client. Uh, it's really important to talk to the supervisor to kind of process those reactions, ensure and think about, you know, is this just my reaction that I need to work on myself or is this more generalizable to others? So that self-reflection is important, considering your reactions and how they might be beneficial to share with the client. That's the key. Like, when is it beneficial to share those reactions with the clients? You know, maybe it would, you know, move forward the goals of counseling. Uh, then, then it's also important, like, if I do talk with my supervisor, I feel like it'd be helpful to, you know, share my reaction toward the clients. How can I do that? Thoughtfully consider how can I share that reaction in a way that can be therapeutic to the client? Uh, so another example, a couple of weeks ago, a client was talking about how he sometimes just uses people. He almost views relationships as transactional, like what can I get out of these relationships? And I started to kind of feel like, you know, I think that's the, oh, I thought I almost pulled the, pulled the cord out. Uh, I kind of got the feeling that the client was viewing me that way, just kind of in this transactional manner. And, you know, to a certain extent, like he is obtaining a service from me. But it was like, it kind of felt like, you know, this might be a similar reaction. So briefly, we kind of processed that. And I brought that up with like, okay, I wonder if this dynamic of using, like using people or kind of viewing them transactionally is playing out with me. And he just kind of sat, sat there and shoot on that. And that's something that I'll likely, you know, process with him moving forward as well. But that's one example, you know, so I felt like, you know, this isn't really, I didn't feel like big personalizations coming up for me. I felt like it was relevant, you know, based on what the client has talked about with outside relationship, what he's working on was surfacing possibly with me. So then it becomes, you know, we can, we can work on that issue experientially in our relationship in a safe relationship. And hopefully as the client works on that issue, they can translate it out, out to other relationships. So those are some of my just thoughts and reactions that I had about personalization. You know, sometimes we need to just, do our work to take care of ourselves and process those. Sometimes it can possibly be beneficial to bring up with the client. But once again, follow those steps of really being thoughtful, checking in with supervisors before you choose to do that, because it's you know important to be really thoughtful when doing that. Okay, I guess just some other thoughts that I had about this week's discussion board. A lot came up for me because a lot was shared. I think that was, I, I applaud you and as, you know, uh, I was proud of you all for, you know, trusting that space to bring those things up. Obviously, the question was asked, but, you know, you, you, you went there and you shared some personal things. Uh, I hope that you understand the importance of empathy, that empathy can be so healing. And that empathy, hopefully, is beginning to translate to self-empathy. I hope that you can, you know... You know, a lot of you are saying that your natural skills or characteristics of being a family counselor is to demonstrate empathy towards others. And I hope that circles back to you, that you can view yourself with empathy, particularly when you're feeling personalizations and those reactions are coming up. Uh, I kind of got the, the, no one necessarily, I can't remember if anyone exactly said this, I don't think so, but I just kind of got this feeling that I want to throw this out there that is it your job to fix the family? You know, whenever we use the word fix in counseling, it's usually like, oh, maybe I'm beginning to overwork. Maybe I'm beginning to overstep my role if I'm seeing it as my role to fix the family. And once again, no one necessarily said that, but I just want to, you know, bring that up again. That, you know, I personally believe that my role is not to fix, you know, the family. And I want to encourage you to hold that belief as well, because that's a quick way to get burnout in counseling work. We're much more like partners where yes, we can be active. Some, some counselors are more directive even, but they're still not the ones fixing the family. That comes from the, the inner resources of the, of the family themselves. So we can be a part in stimulating that, that growth and development. Uh, let's see. The last, the last thought that I want to bring up too is about the ideas for uh, continuing to develop multicultural competence. And I, I appreciated the, the significant consistent emphasis in the discussion board on self-awareness. 
you know, focusing on your own self-awareness as, as a theme and then consulting with supervisors, chatting with them. I think that's a big part of, of you know, growing in our self-awareness is to not just keep that an inner process, but to externalize it, talk about it with other people. At the same, and some of you are bringing up, you know, learning opportunities to get more education, uh, more training, which is super, super important. Uh, one thing that I want to bring up from the gliding text is on page 108. I can't remember if I brought this up previously, but it says that it must be stressed that it is easy to stereotype groups according to cultures and that therapists must take extreme care not to get caught in this trap. They must realize that within group differences are greater than outer outside differences in cultures. Furthermore, they must be open to working with the uniqueness that is every family. So I just wanted to bring that up because it's, it's really important to understand and learn about general characteristics about various populations that we might be working with. And then, as it says here, within group dif differences are greater than those overarching generalizations. So it's important that we don't start to like, oh, in this training, I talked about this for this client population. So it must be true for this specific client. It may be. It's even possible that it's likely true, but we don't know for sure because there's those, you know, every every individual is unique. So I really feel like, you know, gaining a lot of the trainings and learning about different populations gives us, you know, perspective of what possibly might be occurring instead of going in blind. But once again, we still need to understand the unique perspective of the client in front of us. Uh, and that's... Uh, you know, a big part of the multicultural counseling competencies for those of you, I know that many of you have taken the multicultural class, but not everyone. Uh, but you'll learn more about, you know, some of the, the importance of self-awareness, you know, learning about various populations and then learning skills to broach, you know, multicultural, uh, multiculturally relevant issues with clients. <clears throat> And the last thing I want to bring up about the discussion boards, taking quite a bit of time because quite a bit of reactions came up for me too, is that uh, similar experiences are don't translate to the same experience. So I just want to bring that up because sometimes we might really resonate with what a client's feeling like, oh, I know exactly how the client's feeling. I know, like I went through something exactly the same. Like I was an only child, they're an only child, or like I'm the youngest and they're the youngest, or I had this dynamic with my father, or, uh, whatever it is, it might feel like even some of the content might feel like exactly the same. But to remember that in the end, it's not because different people have different filters of how they perceive the experience. You know, so even twins, uh, you have different experiences. Uh, identical twins can have different experiences to a, the same, ex, uh, you know, uh, stimulus, the same, you know, family dynamic. Uh, so just another important thing to consider that it, like so having similar experiences client can, can help with empathy, uh, but sometimes it might lead us to having like closed, oh, I get it. So we like, have blinders on where we need remember you know remembering that the same or similar experiences and the same can keep our vision open to like understand their frame of reference and continue to take another information that we might have been closed off to if we're like oh i get it right away okay uh just a few things about the videos there's four other videos for this week so this week's pretty heavy with the videos uh, i recommend you view them all if you can uh and i also then I'll put some small descriptions under each video so that you can kind of see like, okay, this is a video that really resonates with me. With me, I want to make sure that I watch this whole one or you might kind of be able to skim some of the other ones and, you know, see some of the relevant information. But yeah, I think they're, they're pretty diverse. They, they relate to different elements from, from these three chapters that we're talking about. Uh, and, you know, some of them, two of them in particular have like, demonstrations of how to work with a family and even one you know talks about how to utilize the genogram with the family so once again those notes are, are under each video so you can see that so i look forward to those videos uh, i think they will really help kind of add depth to what does family counseling look like what could it look like or what are some really important you know perspectives to be looking at okay so chapter six i'll go through some of these uh thoughts pretty quick uh but so for chapter six on ethics, uh, legal issues and professional issues. So overall, I just wanted to focus on page 131 from the textbook, because it's talking about those meta ethical principles. So autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, fidelity, and justice. You know, sometimes ethics is kind of pretty clear cut. You know, certain things like don't have sex with your client, don't, you know, disclose 
identifying information to those who aren't supposed to be receiving that. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, where ethical dilemma services, there's not one clear answer. So when there's not one clear answer, uh, I'll talk about, you know, kind of some steps to follow in just a moment. But in the end, a lot of it comes back to these meta ethical principles, these core ethical foundations to, you know, am I ensuring that I'm not doing harm? Like that, at bare minimum, that needs to be, uh, that needs to be there. Am I honoring, you know, the rights of the clients to choose? Am I trying to do good? You know, so once I just, I just felt like those, those principles, that's what the core of ethics is, is how can we live these principles of doing good, um, you know, et cetera, following these, these other principles. So when you're in an ethical, you know, dilemma or an ethical situation where you feel like, oh, something might be off here, you know, I feel like what I've worked with some supervisees before and what I've gone through myself is like, usually it's like, it might be that inner tugging too, you know, like self-reflecting, okay, there might be something off, there might be something unethical, there might be something at least ethical to consider about this situation. So noticing those reactions and self-reflecting is usually a good first step. Then going right to the, the code, oftentimes the ACA code of ethics, you know, that's, that's the, the foundational code that you all need to be very well versed in, that many of you likely are already. Uh, but, you know, go to the code and find the specific codes that are taught, you know, that are relevant to the situation and then consult. I feel like that's a really important step. So after you do your kind of work of self-reflecting, going to the code, you then go consult with a colleague, consult with a supervisor that can then kind of get an additional voice. So you're not making this decision in isolation. You're not avoiding an ethical situation that can be incredibly harmful, something that's, that's, you know, I'd encourage you to avoid. Uh, so just kind of having that transparent vision, you know, perspective of working with and consulting is really important. And if, if at that point, if you've gone through the self-reflection, you've gone to the code, you've, you've consulted with a colleague or a trusted, you know, uh, supervisor or colleague, and you're still, there's still not a clear answer at that point, it's likely a very important to go through an ethical decision-making model. So, if, you know, finding, you know, a model that works, that, that kind of helps you figure out what steps should I go through to really make sure that I, being thoughtful, that I'm being thorough in responding to this ethical situation, and then document the heck out of it. Uh, that's usually part of ethical decision-making models, but document, 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 just to show like, here, here's all the steps that I've taken, and here's why I made the choice that I made based on these principles from the code of ethics. That's where you're really taking care of yourself. So I wanted to go into a little bit of depth because that may help you with the discussion board for this week. Uh, but yeah, those are some ideas there. Uh, let's. Let's jump to chapter seven. So the process of family therapy. I want briefly wanted to talk about the common factors. So let's talk about this at the start of chapter seven. Uh, so common factors can be important. I encourage you to, to, to think about the common factors and be well-versed on, on the common factors. So basically what the common factors are saying is like, there's lots of models, there's a lot of approaches to counseling, but what are the unifying elements between all these models? What, what actually works in counseling? What are those common factors that are there when therapy is working, when counseling is working? So there's extra therapeutic. So extra therapeutic are those kind of outside factors that are outside of the, the, the counseling you know, process that we're not engaged with. So there's just kind of those environmental, those external factors that can influence. So that's a 40% that, you know, what can impact the, the client outcomes, significant. Then 30% is the strength of the counseling relationship, the therapeutic alliance that is developed. So, and this is usually from the perception of the client. So sometimes we might think the, the alliance is super strong or even that it's weak, but that perception might be you know, the opposite of the client. So the client perceiving that I, you know, I feel that this is a trusting environment. I feel like I can be myself. I can, you know, I feel like an empathic connection. So that, that therapeutic alliance is 30%, you know, from the research that, that Scott Miller, he's one of the videos for this week, actually, uh, that they talk about. Uh, and then, you know, to what degree there's a 15% of, of the out. I guess the, the therapeutic outcome of, of improved outcomes is related to the, the hope, the expectancy that the client, uh, you know, kind of feels like, okay, I can hope that thing that my situation will improve. I kind of expect it to improve. 
or even placebo it talks about, you know, placebo factors. So that's 15%. And then the model or techniques that are used. So this is, this is where it gets kind of, uh, a lot of times, like we've in the counseling field, we've really thought this one approach is best, maybe even with these particular individuals. But some of the research that Scott Miller's been doing is saying, you know, actually the model that we use and the techniques we use, that's only a 15%, you know, in uh, like impacting of, of positive outcomes. So the, the therapeutic alliance is double that, 30%. So once again, it's not saying that the model we use and the techniques we use are not important. It's just saying that they're, they're leading to a lesser percentage of, of improved outcomes. But to have a model and have, you know, thoughtful techniques is important, you know. So just those are just some, some general thoughts there on the common factors. Uh, and if this is like, wait, this is kind of blowing my mind or like, wait, I have lots of questions about this. Please watch that Scott Miller video because he goes into the details. He's, you know, done tons of research in this area. That's been kind of his mission. His professional mission has been in this common factors area. So great video to watch. Very knowledgeable about this topic. Okay. Uh, I just briefly wanted to highlight that in chapter seven, it talks about common problems for beginning family counselors. Uh, you know, so they talk about, you know, what do beginning family counselors overemphasize that might be focusing on the details rather than the process that the family is going on through it might be that the, the beginning family counselor, you know, believes that they come to like too early of a resolution, they might think, okay, we're good, we've, we've addressed the issue, but that might just be the surface level issue of there's a larger dynamic underneath the surface. And sometimes they underemphasize certain things so they might underemphasize nonverbal behavior as one example from page 163. But I think, you know, that overemphasis and underemphasis, more, there's more of those uh, that those can kind of be helpful to, to note as a beginning family counselor. Also, this, this chapter talks about, you know, the typical flow of early stages in the family counseling process, the working stages, termination stages. I think that can be really helpful to kind of wrap your head around, you know, what might this look like so in a general kind of, uh, in a general perspective. So I want to talk about two principles here, tri triangulation and circular questioning. Uh, so triangulation, basically, uh, some of you have already used this term and are, seem like you're aware of it, but I just wanted to go into it a little, in a little bit more depth. So triangulation is something pretty important for a family counselor to be aware of because it might be occurring in the family and the family counselor might even be triangulated into a, like a family dynamic. So in general, triangulation is basically where it could be where partners or parents are in order to avoid addressing the conflict or the issues in their relationship, they kind of displace it onto a, a third person. So sometimes that's the scapegoat. It's just like, oh, that's the problem child, or that's the problem individual in the family. So they can all put their emphasis and their focus on that individual when really there's some significant issues to work out between those two. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of a form of avoidance that these triangles, these triangles can develop and it kind of keeps the family in a negative cycle uh, that, you know, a negative dynamic that continues to play out. So, so recognizing those triangles and addressing them can be really important and recognizing like who might be the scapegoat of the family, who's kind of receiving the brunt of the blame when really one individual is not to blame for the dynamic of the family. The system is all, you know, interacting uh, in a circularly causal way as we've talked about. Uh, so in one of the videos uh, that for this week, it talks about, you know, kind of the parents are kind of focusing on the teen, the teenager's behavior that, oh, this, our, our teenage daughter, that's the problem. She needs to change when really there's some significant issues in the marriage and, and the parents individually. So circular questioning. Uh, so I guess the principle behind circular questioning is it kind of expands the sphere of awareness or influence of what's happening in the family dynamic. So for example, uh, in the text it talks about in circular questioning on page 171, it's basically like maybe if, if one person's talking, there may be a parent's talking about how they, you know, have been feeling about the family dynamic, maybe circular questioning is involving maybe some of those more quiet members who haven't really had voice yet on the topic. So it might be like, you know, so child, you know, the child's name, what's this like for you when your dad's talking? Or what, what comes up for you when you see this dynamic playing out at home? Uh, 
and then going to the next family member. So it's kind of like basically a way of, of bringing in additional perspectives into the dynamic that's being addressed. So sometimes there might be very different perceptions of what's happening. And that's, that's kind of where the family system can start to recognize, okay, here's where these different pieces of this family pie are coming together. Uh, some other things, like even with couples counseling, can kind of be helpful to like shift. Uh, sometimes I might say things, what came up for you when he or she said this? Uh, what's your take on this issue that was just brought up? Uh, how do you typically respond when this occurs at home? You know, so, so kind of going between partners or between family members and asking questions similar to that can kind of draw them in and, you know, kind of the circular questioning of bringing everyone in, being able to recognize the circular process. Okay, chapter eight, the only time pressure. This video is a little bit, hopefully not too long. Uh, I just briefly wanted to go on chapter eight about couples and, and marriage uh, therapy and enrichment, I think is the specific title. And I'll just give a little hint. John Gottman is probably a good name to know. And uh, so knowing a, a bit about uh, John Gottman's work would be helpful, likely for the NCE. Uh, and for this course as well, it's kind of helpful to know about a bit about John Gottman. I'll just leave it at that for time's sake. But, you know, I appreciate how this, this chapter talks about EFT, so emotion focused therapy. And some of you have already brought up that you're, you're being somewhat trained in this approach. Uh, I specifically haven't received like credentialing or, or specific training in this model, just kind of based on some of my, my coursework as well. But I, I kind of appreciate it, at least I'm glad I talked about, you know, three stages, general stages to EFT. Uh, and usually it's just, you know, once as the name shows, it's focused on emotion. So noticing those emotional patterns, recognizing those emotional patterns can often be, you know, step one. So just kind of even uh, being able to emphasize the feelings can sometimes diffuse, you know, the content, the conflict of the content and get kind of more to the heart of the issue. You know, stage two, as Gladding talks about with EFT, is that, you know, the partner or each partner or each individual in the family system is emphasized on to, to explore their emotional reactions, to help allow them a space to, you know, express their emotions. And, and also it talks about, you know, attachment bonds. This is an opportunity for them to recognize, okay, maybe some of my unmet early childhood needs you know, there's been, there's been challenges there that those early needs weren't met. So I'm trying to like have them meet or have them met later in life in my current relationships. Uh, that can often be therapeutic for the individual, but then also helpful for the system because they're all able to better understand each other and be able to kind of recognize, oh, here's how I can, maybe feelings are okay. Maybe I can, you know, embrace my the reactions of this family member and I can demonstrate empathy. And then stage three is kind of that wrap up of reviewing and focusing on what are these newly developed patterns. Uh, last, last point that I want to talk about is on page 205 to 206. Uh, I feel like you know, this is on divorce counseling or divorce therapy. And there was eight, eight points that were listed of like some helpful techniques. They're not exactly like, here's exactly what you say or do, but I think there's some eight kind of general principles of techniques that can be helpful. So I want to just uh shift your attention there uh so the first point is listening for free feelings in conversations rather than facts because feelings reflect an individual's values you know i think that's a pretty helpful rationale of why emotions are important to focus on uh they talk about the use of i statements you know saying nope we're not going to use you statements because you like saying you do this it's often leads into a blaming dynamic i statements are taking ownership of my reactions uh, so anyways, I, I encourage you to, to shift your focus there as well. But once again, I appreciate y'all. Uh, I think we're, we're having some great discussions. This discussion this coming week is going to be a little bit different. Many of you are going to be at uh, Summer Labs and you won't be required if you're at Summer Labs to do the discussion. So the, you know those individuals will be posting it later. So those of you who don't have Summer Labs, you'll notice that there's probably less people posting this week. That's That's normal. That's okay. It's just due to summer labs and accommodating the, the rigor of that that process so uh just engage with those who are there and kind of proceed as usual and kind of have some follow-up the following week for those who, who aren't there 
Uh, if you have questions about just Summer Labs and how we're shifting things around, basically whatever is due the week that you're at Summer Labs, there's just a one week extension being given. So I sent out some announcements and information already, but reach out if you have questions. All right, thanks everyone. I look forward to another week.